Welcome to the National Correct Coding Initiative Edit. I am Tom Ryan, and I'll be your presenter. I'm with WPS Government Health Administrators, Provider Outreach and Education. Again, I am joined today by Aline Ziegler, and she is from my team, one of my friends as well. She gets to do the job of technical support, which means she's going to look at that chat, monitor the chat for questions, try to help you out with anything she can. Um, and then you're welcome to go ahead and add any questions to the chat. If time permits at the end, we will answer those questions. What happened to get this webinar in place? Why are we doing the National Correct Coding Initiative or NCCI again? And a lot of people ask us this. We continue to have a lot of questions come in. It is one educational event that people want to hear live. They want to have that opportunity to ask questions if they want them. So we did take questions in advance. We looked at comments and we looked at other events and we looked at survey feedback. We looked at bundling denials. And we determined that this is another good avenue to get you some education on. So this is driven from a variety of different sources. And yes, one of those is your suggestions on those surveys. So you're going to hear later me talk about that, but I want you to remember to take the survey at the end. It's very key and critical. Of course, as with any of our webinars, I do need to give you a bit of a disclaimer here. So we did prepare this education. Um, it is for educational purposes only. Many of you that have been with Medicare know that Medicare rules change. Sometimes every five minutes it feels like, and sometimes it feels like, oh, that one at least hasn't changed in a long time. So with that in mind, if any of the rules do change, you do need to check the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services CMS website. I'm going to show you that website later because that's where the edits are actually located and a lot of the information is located to help you through this process. So again, the information is current as of today, but it can always change. And the edits do get updated. So the um, one set gets updated annually and the other ones get updated quarterly. So you want to make sure you're aware of that. I will provide responses to questions based on the facts that were given. I put this in here and we continue to put it in here because some of the information that I was given in the pre-submitted questions are things you were looking for. I don't necessarily know exactly what you want. I'll do the best I can. I may say, hey, if you want some clarification, I still need you to put something in chat on that because I'm not really sure where you're going with it. I will try to answer those as I go through the presentation as well. Um, and then just as a reminder, CMS does prohibit the recording of this for profit making purposes. We do not allow recording at all because we can't ensure how you're going to use it. And we want to make sure we don't have that violated by CMS or anything else. So what we instead will do is to put an encore out there and the encore will be available on our YouTube playlist. Now that brings me to my first question. How do I locate the encore material? This person has attended other events and is unable to locate the Encore. So let me just first start off doing this. If you're not familiar with YouTube, it is the number one source of our Encores. Why do we say that? Because all of our Encores are on this, um, this YouTube channel. So I do recommend go to YouTube.com, search WPSGHA or WPS Government Health Administrators. Um, if you put at WPSGHA Education, that's our handle, you're more than welcome to do that too. So you can do whatever you want. Just want to make you guys aware of that. I did have a link put the Encore playlist, which is where I'm going to go next, in the chat feature. So you're going to find this on the playlist. Um, you can go through all of our videos, but we have a lot of them. But, uh, so I always recommend, hey, hit that Encore playlist up. What you can do is if you don't want to have to look through all the playlists down here, you can simply search Encore. Now, what's great about our Encore playlist is that it is um, available to you. It's the third item right here. You can see it. But what it's going to do is give it to you in order of published. So the oldest ones will be at the bottom, the newest ones at the top. So if you're coming, it'll be right at the top for you. The other thing you can do um, with this is if it'll be uh, benefits or if it's in systems, you can look through all those different types of playlists because we do have a huge number of playlists available. And I'm just going to go back to the playlist and just quickly show you that. So if you wanted to say, hey, does this apply to something? You can always look for the different edits. We do have two system ones because we do have two different billing systems. So um, you'll look for this for Part A, which is UB04, uh, A37Is. You'll look for um, MCS for Part B, which is 1500 or um, A37P. Those are two also additional places you can find. So with that, let's jump on and move right back to our agenda. Again, this education was developed to provide a clear understanding of how Medicare uses the NCCI edits, the purpose of them, to get through those general questions, but also then to tell you the types and locations of where you're going to find the edits. So 
when we took the questions and we really analyzed the data, what we discovered is some people are really new, and you're going to see that in some of the questions that I get, and you're going to see that in some of my responses. Okay. So with that, we do want to talk about the very second question. Okay. Before we leave this slide, and the per person said, "I'm really new to Medicare, and I'm still getting confused over NCCI or the National Correct Coding Initiative and CCI, the Correct Coding Initiative. What's the difference?" And the answer is, there's no difference. They are exactly the same thing. It's the acronym used. Some people will just use CCI and some people will use NCCI. They are the exact same thing. So please don't be confused over that. Set that one aside right now today. First thing we're gonna do um, beyond that is talk a little bit about the purpose of the edits. Why were they put in place? This then helps to find the usefulness of them. What is the goal of these edits with CMS and why are they here? Now, directly, the purpose is question that we had, but, um, which is actually a second question related to the topic of the third question. And the question, what is the purpose of them? The person also did add in a little, a little funny in here, and they said, is it to annoy the providers? No, that's really not CMS's intent, although I'm sure some of you do find them annoying. Um, so our, really, our goal for this is to kind of go through and just talk a little bit about the purpose and what they're used for. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, we talk a little bit about some of the reasons and the things you need to know. Okay. So first, the number one goal of the correct coding initiative at it is to look at correct coding, to make sure that you're not unbundling things or building more than what should be built, so that when a procedure is all encompassing and defined by Medicare, that one overall, that one encompassing procedure is done. Also, when you should not build two things together, right? So you don't need to build a virtual colonoscopy and otherwise, <clears throat> and a, a different colonoscopy at the same time. They're going to give you the same results. Well, hopefully they do. So we don't need them build together. So they're really looking for some of that. They're looking also to help correct submission of claims. So this would be something like an add-on code to make sure that the secondary code is with the primary code. Did you build for the two codes together? And we're going to talk more about these examples in a little bit. Also, they want to make sure that they ensure correct payment. Because Medicare does have set rules, and we do this in order to protect the Medicare trust fund. Now, there's the hospital trust fund, and then the otherwise trust fund, or supplemental insurance trust fund. It's the Part B trust fund, if you want to think of it that way, and hospitals for inpatient care. And both of them have rules that are set to kind of help protect the trust fund. And CCI, or National Crop Coding Initiative, is one set of rules to do that. Also, it is to protect the patient's payment. Now, a couple people have said I don't understand that. And what it does is it can actually reduce that payment by saying this is a bundled service, so therefore the patient owes 20% of this amount instead of these three component amounts that all go into that one primary service. It also looks at things like add-on codes and may it add the additional 20%, but it's a little bit of a different rate than billing for two completely separate procedures. So we really do use them for that purpose. Um, it also helps to prevent things like double billing, so, for instance, a once-in-a-lifetime service or where there's only a certain number that can be billed at a certain time. So, we'll talk about those different types of codes. Really, if you look at it overall, it's to make sure that the Medicare coding and billing guidelines um, are met and to make sure that we're protecting the trust funds as much as we can. All right, if you have more questions on that, I definitely want to take those. But we're going to go ahead and have you throw those in chat, and I'll stop a little bit later and get you those questions answered. One of the key things that we need to everyone to be aware of is these edits are not written by your Medicare Administrative Contractor or MAC, which is WPS. We do follow them and we do stick them into our system. Now, when I say stick them into our system, because the edit is written for us, it's a downloadable file that we put in and we run to make sure it's going to work correctly and not cause other issues. That is our job. But these are national edits. So CMS uses these edits and they use a contractor to write them. The um, contractor then reports to CMS, which is why you have this general email on the screen and it's right here. Now, I do want to show you that this is an email that if you were to select it, it would go ahead and open the email up for you. So if there are general questions you want to ask this contractor who wrote that, we can't answer those. Now, on the other hand, if it's something about how your claim process, those are questions that come into the individual Medicare administrative contractor. So while it may be a national edit, the claims questions are still handled by your MAC. You want to make sure you're hopefully aware of that. 
Um, and so the, the question was, I have a bundling issue going on and it doesn't seem as though the edits are being followed. Who do I contact with that? That is a Medicare Administrative Contractor or MAC question. Contact WPS, please give us the claim number, be prepared for that. We're gonna need to look that up, we're gonna need to work with that. This is one of the times when I always recommend to people, you can make a phone call, but it's way easier to stop and put it in writing. Let our team go back and research that and get you the best possible answer versus trying to speculate with you and to look at it really quickly on the system. Now, again, I do understand there are times when that phone call is better. I get it. But if you can, please put it in writing. All right. So that answers a couple of questions. We're going to keep moving here. Next, I want to look at the edit types because CMS does divide these into three specific types of edits. Remember, the National Correct Coding has one set goal, but to do that, we do have to look at different ways and different um, types of edits to make that happen. So let's talk about those different types of edits. All right, so there's two tables. Well, there's three tables, but um, I'm sorry, there's two tables for the three types. Try that again. Two tables, three types. The two tables are for Part B services both, but one is for professional and ambulatory surgery centers. The other is the hospital outpatient code editor. So again, this is only services in a hospital outpatient. Someone did ask if this applies to something called a critical access hospital, in other words, a small community hospital, and, and yes, the code editor still works for them, still applies to them. Um, their payment methodology is different than an inpatient acute facility, so it's two different payment methodologies, but it can still be the outpatient code editor when they're performing an outpatient service. An outpatient service, whether it's professional, ambulatory surgery center, or a hospital, they are all Part B services. So this only applies to Part B services. I say that because Part A services, which are your inpatient care services, have their own set of bundling rules, and they do work a little bit differently. So you want to make sure that you're aware that this is a Part B. So when you ask the hospital, hey, is that patient there? And they say, mm, nope, or yep, but, we're not paying, Medicare's not paying anymore, that means it's gonna be a Part B service. So you're aware of that and how this all works together. Now, while we do have the two tables, we also then have the three types. And the three types are the procedure to procedure edit. This is the one that most people are familiar with. And it says these procedure codes, there are two of them. One is payable and one is not when billed with the other one. So we're gonna talk more about those. The second type is the medically unlikely edit. Uh, a comment that was made on this one is that it's the medically unlikable edit. Okay, um, I do think that's kind of cute, but just so everyone is aware, they are unlikely edits. These are things that are based to not happen as frequently, or in some situations, it's not safe to do it that many times in a certain setting. Now, for those of you that don't understand that comment, if you have a certain number of surgeries occurring in an ambulatory surgery center and the overall surgery um, can bring up the risk affecting the patient. So therefore, if you hit this certain level, then it's not safe for them to be in that ambulatory surgery center. So while the ambulatory surgery center could maybe do up to two of those, if they do four, three, whatever it is, that's what we're looking at when we say it's not safe. That's where the medically unlikely edits can come into play. Now, again, not always like that, though, because some of them are not like that. Some of them are data-driven. Some of them are procedure code driven. Some of them are lifetime driven. So there's a variety of different things, and we'll talk more about them. And last are the add-on code edits. So the add-on codes are exactly what they sound like. You have to have a primary procedure, and these are the secondary to build the primary. So each one of these is then built into the system um, via a file, and we then make sure those systems work correctly um, and the systems are the MCS system and the multi-carrier system, which processes the CMS 1500 claim form and the 837P electronic transactions. That would be the medical professional and ambulatory surgery center edit. There is also the FIS system, which is the physical intermediary shared system. This processes the UB04 or the 837I electronic transactions, and this is the one that uses the outpatient code editor. So you want to make sure that when you go out and you're looking at these edits, that you're in the right set of edits. Uh, most of the time, they're the same, but on occasion, they can vary. And a great example of that is surgical code. Again, we talked about it. Ambulatory surgery center is in one system, while the other one would be outpatient hospital. So you want to make sure you're using the two sets correctly just to make sure you're getting the right thing. 
All right, what I'd like to do now is to go ahead and move through the types of edits. We're going to talk a little bit about the edit on the slide, and then I'm going to take you to the CMS website, and we're going to show you the edit page, and we're going to show you a couple of different things you need to be aware of. So this one will take a little bit of time, and it's going to go a little bit back and forth. So we'll start with the AOCs, or the add-on code edit. So this is the first type of edit, and the reason that I chose to start with this is, one, it becomes alphabetically, so let's use that. Two, it's also one of the ones that is the easiest for most people to understand. A couple of things you need to know. One, they do have a coding requirement that is set up by whoever wrote the code. So it could be HICS HICS codes, the Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System, or it could be the current procedure terminology codes, CPT codes. So when these coding guidelines are written, they say this code is only billable if you have this code and you meet this. So it could be an additional 15 minutes, could be a complexity requirement. There's a variety of other things that play into that. So that's why we have the add-on code edit. So as they're written into the guidebook, what happens is someone has to put them into the system, and that's where these code edit lists come from. There's simply a mechanism to put those codes from the guidebook into our system. Okay. So remember, if it's a primary code, Reported alone, it's perfectly fine. So long as it's medically necessary, we'll consider it for payment. If it's an add-on code reported alone, we will not. We will automatically deny it. We have to have the primary code before we can even consider it. And it has to be in the clinch processing system. So what does that mean? It means the primary and add-on code must match for the same date of service, for the same patient, and for the same provider. Um, one of the questions that came in in regards to the add-on code is does Medicare use the definition of same provider or does it use one person? Let me explain that. Medicare uses the definition of same provider. What that means is that it is a person, one or more people under the same tax identification number with the same Medicare specialty performing a service for the same patient on the same date of service. Medicare then says it's one provider. Um, if you have more questions on one provider, I'd really like you guys to throw those in the chat, okay? What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go to the CMS website and we're actually gonna look at how to locate the add-on code edits and I'm gonna use an example. So, all right, so first thing we gotta do, bring up the website, go to cms.gov. Now, again, we're talking about Medicare. CCI. Do not get and do not just look at CCI and think, oh, because there's also Medicaid. So we want to talk about Medicare and we want to talk about coding and billing. The National Correct Coding Initiative edits the gender coding. You go in and I want to stick right on this left column. It looks like the Moodle column on your screen, but it's the left one in the blue and you'll see the item down here. Um, I'm sorry, the fifth item down here is the National Correct Coding Initiative edits. What's great is this will bring you to your base page. So everything I've pretty much described is gonna be here. I wanna point out just a couple of things and we're gonna to come to some of this stuff later. Let's go down just a little bit. Um, and then you've got your implementation, your replacement files. Some of you asked us about where things are located when new information comes out. Take a look at this information. Contact information and submitting an appeal. So there's a variety of different pieces of information here. I also then want to point out some navigation items along the left. So your policy, your, I'm sorry, your NCCI policy manual is exactly that. It will explain the CMS NCCI edit and all the information you need to know. Correspondence language manual. Then you're going to hit the third one. This is your add-on code edit. And they tell you right below that you've got your FAQs, medically unlikely archive with medically unlikely following it, and the procedure to procedure. We'll get to the next set of edits coming up shortly. But let's stop at this add-on code. So we can go ahead and read, oh, you've got type one, type two, and type three. We know what are they. It's gonna explain all of these different things. And so what's great about it is this will then help you know what you're looking for. Um, I do recommend that, you know, while this is great, actually scroll down and read these if you are interested in learning any of these things, but it will explain it. Notice the announcements. So if there's new codes, there's new add-on codes, there's new updates that need to be done, they will put in an announcement out here and I just think it's really important that you take a look at this. I'm gonna keep scrolling down because I want you to see another item here. It says related downloads. 
and you're going to see here are your codes. Now, I'm going to open the 401 codes because that's the most recent effective date one. So we want to make sure we're using those ones. But if you needed to go back, it does go by date of service. So you could look back before that if you needed to, which is why there are archives and other things for some of the other types. But so when I select this, what it will do is ask me to look for a file. Um, um, Aline, did my file come up? My zip file? I am still seeing your um, desktop file, not the file itself. Okay. Let's try it, opening that up again. So I'm sorry, you guys, oh, oh. Okay, now does the file come up? <laughs> yes, yeah, file? this is for two. Yep. Okay, sorry everybody, it takes a little bit of time to work through that. So um, what happens is, is I did select the file and then it opens in the zip software, I have to open the zip software and then after I open the zip software, I have to open the Excel file. Um, so this is just the Excel file. Um, now what I did on this one is, uh, I believe I opened the physician file. So this would be your um, 1500 and your ambulatory surgery center coding, um, professional coding, all of those types of things. Very similar to the outpatient code editor, they look the same, they're just, they, they might be slightly different for a few things. You can see it actually will list your code, okay? It's gonna tell you what type of add-on code it is. And so we can go back, if you wanna go back, you would go to the CMS website and you would say, oh, this is a type two. What does that mean? Well, that means that a type two does not have a specific list of primary procedure codes. And then it explains how that works. So hopefully that all makes sense. Now, the reason that it doesn't, and you'll see right here, contractor defines primary, this means that we as a contractor have the right to tell you what your primaries will be, which is why it's CCC. This is not a real procedure code, okay? Um, I do wanna just use an example. Someone asked me about an add-on code and it's an evaluation and management add-on code. And it was the G2212, if I remember correctly, but I'm not looking in the right code file here. Okay, so if I just simply use control F, which is what bought my find and replace up, I typed in my code and then I just highlighted the codes that I was looking for. It will tell you that these are the codes you can use that add-on code with. So if you notice, it says 99215, 205, and 483. These are your highest level complexity of add-on codes. Okay? Other things just to be aware of with this particular file, um, there could be a termination date. So it's effective from here and until here. Now this one, obviously it doesn't have it. You'll see that it says like, well, this is still in effect. So hopefully all of that makes sense. And that's how you read your add-on code file from CMS. But again, these should match what's in the CPC book. If they don't, that's when you're gonna to wanna to contact that email address that I showed you earlier. All right, jump back to our slides here for a moment. What we're gonna do next um, is to look at the next set of edits. Next set of edits, oops. Okay, so procedure to procedure edit, called PTPs, procedure to procedure. This is the one that I talked about when you have two procedure codes, one will pay and one will not. So if they're billed separately, they'll pay, but if they're billed together, one will pay and one will not. So they have to, again, have the same data service, they have to be for the same provider, but remember, here again, we do use that provider specialty and tax identification number to determine same provider. They also have to be for the same patient. Um, so if something is billed incorrectly for the wrong patient, it gets paid. We actually had someone discover that they had billed a claim incorrectly because they got paid and they were not expecting to. So we wanna make sure we're doing that and we wanna make sure this is a good op opportunity for that. Um, some combinations will allow a modifier. So that's interesting, but that's so that you can look at things and say, okay, normally we wouldn't make two separate payments, but medically necessary documented services that show maybe significant work or show it on a different portion of the body. It's so right and the left. They could allow modifiers for that. And then always remember the payable code is in column A while the bundled code is in column B. We call that the sometimes payable code. Always payable column A, sometimes column B. I wanted you to note right here on the bottom, this says updated quarterly. So each quarter CMS releases that Unlike the AOC edits, which were updated annually, most of the AOC edits or the um, add-on code edits do get updated annually because that's when the books are updated. That's why it works that way. These ones, on the other hand, are updated a little bit more frequently, okay? 
So again, if you have questions on how the edits work, that would go to the email that I showed you earlier, and I'll show you that on the website again. If you have questions on how a claim process relating to the edit, that comes to us. So let me give you an example. I don't like these two codes together. This code should not go with this code. I shouldn't have to do anything. Okay, that makes sense. Or in this type of patient, this code and this code should happen, but this is the way that it is. Those are questions that are not related to us. Those are clinical questions. Those are other types of things that are not related to the actual clinch process that we just follow the edit. So we're gonna go back to this page. Now, if you remember how I got there, it was, C, it was uh, CMS.gov, Medicare. We then selected the um, coding and billing and the National Correct Coding Initiative at it. We looked at a few things here. So if you are looking for that information that I talked about, when you don't like the two edits together or you don't like whatever the situation is, here is an example. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't change. Oh, there we go. It doesn't change. This is where I got that email address. So it's always right here for you. You can send in whatever you don't like. We can't resolve anything unless it's changed you know, within the system. Talk about some workarounds, but we can't really resolve it. Um, so go back up. With that, we want to take a look at the section on the left, and this will take us to the actual edits. Now, again, the procedure to procedure are the last edits. It's down here on the bottom. And inside the procedure, procedure to procedure, it does tell us right away, hey, these are quarterly version updates. Remember what I talked about hospital and I talked about practitioner, what falls into each one. Key, outpatient hospital edits are on the UB04 or the 837i. And practitioner is MCS, which is 1500 or 837p. Um, um, I'm gonna go ahead and select my edit system. And I apologize, it's gonna take me a little bit. You guys, I selected the bottom one, which turned purple. Still not opening, sorry about this. Um, oh, no, that's a different file that I looked up earlier today. There we go. So here you can see this is your procedure code edit. Um, and you can see it's just a, a list of columns. When I said column A, this is your payable code. When I said column D, this is your bundled code. It goes into this one, okay? This just means it's older than 1996, and that's when CCI officially began. So there was some information for uh, before 1996 that did the same thing, but the official edits are then moved in. That's why some of them don't have an effective date or a termination date. And the termination date simply is done for a variety of reasons, such as code change, it's no longer valid at all, so the coding guidelines, um, it could also be something that due to technology changes is now not considered bundled. That would be something that would have been done through that process that I told you to email the questions to. Okay. Then we hit F and this is your modifier column. Zero, no, you cannot separate these two. So even if you appended a modifier to column two code, you will not get this page. Okay. Not, not gonna happen. One means, yes, you could append a modifier. I'm gonna show you some of those, or you could do an appeal to get this page, okay? So one in column F means yes. What do you have to do before you just throw a modifier on there? Because that was a question that I was asked. The question is what documentation is needed? You need to show why it is a different location, anatomy-wise, what's going on there. So it could be an RC and an LT. You need to show why um, it's significantly more work or it needed to be done in that manner. Sometimes you'll want to append certain modifiers that will separate them from other things. So you always want to make sure you're looking at that. So was it the decision for surgery? Well, there's a modifier for that. But you also want to make sure the modifier is applicable. And we'll talk about that in just a moment because one of the examples I have um, actually has that is the example. Okay, so um, let's see. So again, these are updated quarterly. You wanna make sure you use that. It will also then tell you the rationale. Some of them are fraud and abuse. That this one, misuse of column two with column one, which is why it's not allowed in, in some cases. But again, it is a uh, misuse, fraud and abuse. These are just standards of medical practice. A lot of times these are what the CPT guidelines put in place. So there's a variety of different ones. Let me see here, control F. The one that I wanna look up, and I'm gonna use just in my example in general, is a 99213. Now, I like this office visit code for two reasons. First, you can see here when billed with a 
2141, it's in column two. This means a modifier 25 could be appended to separate the payment out if the documentation supports it. And I wanna make that as clear as possible your documentation must support the reason you feel it is significant, separately identifiable. You feel that this is separate from that service. Okay, we wanna make sure we're doing that. Let's continue with the 992 and free, just keep going down our list here. Because one of the questions we had was modifier 25 usage. Um, I just gotta scroll, let me, let me do it this way here. Let me get towards the bottom. Uh, too far. Sorry, look away if you don't like this really fast scroll. I'm just trying to find one that will give us what we need here. Um, let's see. All right, so here's the difference. Notice the 99213 is now in the primary. This means you do not append a modifier to this. You would append a modifier to this one if it's applicable. So let's say we have this example right here, and we have a 99213, and then we have a 0362P. Yes, you could append a modifier. Yes, we know it's still a front end use, the misuse one. We understand that. We want to make sure we're looking at that code pair combination together. And then does your documentation support that? So let's take a look at, um, I know I saw this come up and I apologize. I'm going to um, ask Aline to give me the other code. I did see a code come up, but I don't have the question up in front of me. I mean, there was a question if I could look at something related to this, 99213, yeah, something, I mean but I don't know if it's a code. Yeah, 99213 and 90832. 90832. Okay. Going down. I just got to get right back to the right code here. Oh, no, go back up. Hmm. Uh, let me do it this way. Let's go back to the 99213s. And once we get to those, I'm just going to scroll down quick. Nine zero eight six. I don't have this one as a code pair combination. Um, so when you look at this, it means that this code pair um, as, uh, combination doesn't exist. That there's no three two in this code pair combination. So this would not be a, a procedure to procedure bundling at it under the National Card Coding Initiative. All right, so hopefully that kind of helps you understand the, those edits. I did want to talk a little bit more about column F and the modifiers. A lot of people um, did ask us about examples of modifiers that could be used, and we'll get more into this. But in particular, what I want to do is jump back to the website for just a moment before I leave this. So I don't have to come back here again. Take a look at the FAQ library. When you look at the FAQ library, you can look at the different types of edits and you can look at which modifiers will override based on that. And there's a whole category on it. So I will go through a little bit more with this. I just wanted to show you the space information um, as I was already out here. So if you're talking about NCCI modifiers that will override NCCI, there's a variety of them. Take a look at this information, um, especially when you're talking about procedure to procedure code edits. This is where a lot of our questions came in to um, so we want to make sure you're aware of that. The next slide which should bring you to MUEs. One thing I do want to remind you is this is medically unlikely edits or MUEs. What these are is the maximum units of service reported for a procedure code. Now, sometimes they're a line item. Sometimes they're a data service driven one. So it just depends. But remember, they are related to the provider, the same provider, the same patient, and the same data service always. Now we say, uh, I shouldn't say data service always. That one can be a little mis misnomer. Some of these would be um, a lifetime procedure or other types of things like that where you can only go once in a lifetime for certain things. So we do know that some of the MUEs are not necessarily data service driven, instead they're patient driven, but they always have to be either patient or provider or they have to be some combination. One of the questions that we got was, do all procedure codes have MUEs? And the answer is no. Second, are all MUEs publicly available on the CMS website? And again, the answer is no. CMS does this as a fraud and abuse prevention technique. So if you have something that comes up, we're going to talk about what happens if you get hit with an MUE edit and you have the documentation to support the medically necessity portion of it. Let's move back to the um, website and we'll talk more about MUEs and hopefully get a little bit of better understanding of some of this stuff. 
So medically unlikely edits, again, we're just back on this same section. We're gonna move to the medically unlikely edit. Now, I will tell you the archive is available right above it. We're gonna look at the bottom one. Somebody asked, why do the procedure to procedure edits not have archives? And if you remember, they had an effective and a deletion date. They don't need an archive for that purpose. Once it's on the list, it's always there. That doesn't mean that they don't publish quarterly releases and that some information may not change, which is what we want to make sure you're aware of. And that's why we check out this page over here and you check out the different related links. And then you come down to what's going on with different things. So make sure you're looking at all those newses and other things that have to be done. Here's the announcement. All right, so back up, sorry. When we look at the medic, um, when we look at the medically unlikely edit, we do again have the DME supplier table. We're not gonna go into that one today. Facility talked about this and practitioner, and we talked about this. I'm gonna try to open this practitioner table up. We'll see how that goes for me. Well, I got that far so far, we're good. Next is to actually open the MUE edit up. And this one I actually had open already. You guys saw this earlier, just give me a second to find it. So here, these again are based on procedure codes. And what it says is here is the number that can be built. What's important to understand is to look across and read this. Some of them are data service, some of them are line, other types of things like that. So each one of these will have a value appended to it. So this is the total data service and it's a clinical. The policy, and then it tells us where they come from, including a code description. CPT says, hey, you can't build more than one of this at a day. Okay, so these are how we look at these different types of edits. Um, I'm trying to find one that is reason, 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 column. Line item. <laughs> Took me a while to find that one. So this one says you can only build four units on uh, 99486 for four units on a line. So if you need to build more, you just build a second line. Find a modifier, you're good. So that's where we look at some of these different ones where we look at data service versus line item versus the different things. And that's what I was trying to show you was just how to find that, um, the type of edit that it is. So again, medically unlikely says if you're billing this procedure code for the same patient, for the same um, practitioner, then you wanna make sure that you're following this on a line. If you do need to bill more, that's fine. Fill a total line with that. Second, if you see it's a line item, you can always separate them by line item, and then what you do is append a modifier to the second line. And that would work for almost any of these that are publicly available. Um, so you would append, it could be a 59, if that's the modifier that works best. It could be an RT or an LT. It could be something stating a finger or a digit modifier. Those will all work for ones that will actually override this. So again, you just wanna make sure you're looking at this Please remember that, again, these are updated quarterly, and that's why we have an archive. That's January, April, July, and October when the updates are implemented, usually released between four to six weeks before they're actually updated. So you wanna make sure um, that it's that it's a code pair, um, or, um, I'm sorry, you wanna make sure that you're reading the most current code pair combinations along with the most current number of unit combinations. All right, uh, I'm gonna use 992 and 3 again just because I like that one. Why do I like it? Because I used it already, so we're using it again. Really no other purpose. <laughs> so this one says, if you're doing an evaluation and management service, you can build two of these per day to service. If you do need to build more for any reason, someone said, why would I need to build two per day to service? And I can give you an example. A patient comes into the um, emergency room or even into the office setting because they're sick. They go home and they fall down and now they come back because they fell down. Well, they still might be sick and it still might be a correlation, but the example of the falling doesn't relate to the sickness necessarily. So therefore they may not be related and that may be considered two separate evaluation and management codes. Hopefully that doesn't make sense, but that would just be an example of one you could build to. All right, let's go ahead and go back to our PowerPoint for a few moments and we're gonna talk more about some of the other things. I've mentioned this a few different times, and one of the key things that we're looking for here is this documentation. You need to tell us why in the delivery method and why your documentation supports that there's something going on to make those two procedure codes separately payable, to make more than that higher number. So we do know that there are um, NCA, um, I'm sorry, MUEs that are not publicly available. Again, we understand that. 
So when we look at that, you may have to do an appeal to show that they are higher. So you say, hey, this is an updater. This only allows me to do one. I really need to do two. We're not saying don't do it. We're saying if your documentation supports the need for it and the delivery of it in that method, so that the key is tying it together, then you're going to have to do an appeal. This is not a WPS decision. This is a CMS decision. So until that is updated to reflect whatever you need to reflect or until that any of changes, you have to file an appeal. Okay. Um, so what specific documentation overrides it? There is nothing specifically that will override any of these. It really is the key to the overall descriptions and the overall information within that supporting documentation. Can you identify why it is more than the standard, whether that is a significant and separately identifiable service, whether that's two separate body parts, whether that's two separate lesions on the body, something to explain why they are not tied together. Okay. Um, what is the additional work is one thing you will always have to answer. So here's my standard work. Okay, I did this add-on code, but you told me the additional work was because the person didn't speak English. Well, that's not always true. That's part of the built-in information, unless you're doing certain types of service, which would be an example of mental health. Then there's an additional add-on code that goes with that, which would be in the AOC code file. So then you have to be able to tell us all of these different key components. Okay, hopefully that does make sense. Someone again did ask me about the modifiers. Here are a list of the commonly used modifiers. If you're looking for the um, information on the 59, the XD, XD, XS, and XU, I will talk more about these in uh, just a few moments. But you want you to know that is what this modifier fact, I'm sorry, this um, CMS, Medicare Learning Network fact sheet is about. Okay, so when we look at the common use modifiers, this is just a way of telling Medicare that it's different. Two separate things going on here. One of the questions is, do I have to use the X's, X modifiers, or can I use a 59? And CMS, in their fact sheet, which is right here, explains these are optional. You must use one of them, but it's optional. We always recommend using the one that has the best verbiage, which is um, going to be one of the X, which would explain it better. But if 59 does work, no, you're not required to use it. Okay? When Medicare does expect you to use any other modifier before you use a 59, that means that if a finger or a toe applies, you're gonna use that. If RTLT applies, you're gonna use that. We really do expect to see any other form of a modifier before you would just put a 59 on there. Again, one more time, if you're coming back here and you're looking at all of this information and you wanna know where the modifier information is, you need to go to the FAQs, Again, CMS publishes these, not us. You're gonna to go to the NCCM modifier information and you can read through. Again, I mentioned a few of them, definitely not all of them because there's quite a few different ones that you want to make sure you're aware of. So hopefully that helps you understand a little bit about modifiers. And again, I do recommend always looking at modifier 25, making sure that if you're using it on a procedure to procedure code edit, that the, um, the ENM code is the second B, column B code, okay. All right, go ahead and move on from those. Appeals, I mentioned this once already and I do wanna talk a little bit about it because we did have a couple of questions come in. So yes, an appeal can happen related to NCCI edits. First, medically unlikely edits when you can support that you need more than what the edit allows is an, is an appeal. You will deny it and you have to do an appeal. That was a CMS decision. It's not something we can do or something we can change. So, um, so appeals are very frequent with um, MUEs, uh, just so you are aware. Um, append a modifier to indicate the documentation supports the need. If you appended a modifier correctly, you may actually be able to avoid the denial and therefore avoid the appeal. So check that out. You can also do a clerical error reopening in a lot of cases to append that modifier, and that's done in our portal, or you can um, correct the claim if you wanted to in the DDE system. And then appeal to now with, with the supporting documentation. Do you see this last part about supporting documentation? Tell me why. What makes it medically necessary? What makes it more? So you want to make sure we're getting there. Um, we're getting that information yet. Okay. We'll move on to some questions. So I, um, I did have some question or quote unquote modifier 59 clarity. I'm not really sure what all you're looking for with that. I answered it as best I could. Um, 
how often are the NCCI edits reviewed and updated? And remember, two types quarterly, one type annually. Um, Add-on codes pretty much annually, and that's done because they're written based on the CPT coding books and, and the uh, HICSPIX coding books. So because of those coding guidelines, they're only updated annually, typically, uh, otherwise quarterly. Uh, if a, the MUE is two or uh, is two and the MI left, if the medically unlikely added is two, but you need to build three, but we have a total of four, need, four units, what do we do? So you're going to build two. You can always build a second line and append a modifier of two if you know, or append a modifier to get the additional page to tell us there's additional documentation. Now, if you don't know that and you build, you build all four on one line. And then you do have to follow the appeal with the documentation, supporting the number of units, supporting the units above the MUE level, above that MUE level. With that said, I'd like to stop for just a moment um, and actually go ahead and go back to um, Aline and see if we have any questions. Hi, oh, Tom. Yes, we have gotten a few questions. Um, I know that you've answered a couple of them. One question. Um, came in before you actually demonstrated where providers can go to find the information about how to appeal um, in this situation. It was actually an MUE number. They feel it should be higher um, just because uh, the modifier is not allowed. So if they disagree with the number of an MUE, and how can that get resolved so they don't have to deny every single one and appeal every single one? Sure. So um, remember, the appeal comes to us, and that's submitting a regular appeal, uh, same thing, redetermination, reconsideration, all those five levels. But otherwise, it's just contact information. So I'm back on CMS. I just went to NCCI. I'm going to use contact information. I'm going to scroll down, and it's right here. This is where you're going to email. Next question. Yes, thank you for that. Okay, so then we got the question about demonstrating the 99213 and the 90832 for procedure to procedure, and you and you showed us that. But then we got a follow-up question, and she says, since, if you remember, it didn't show up as being um, a, a procedure to procedure code pair edit, so she says, does that mean that the 90832 is not payable on the same day by different providers billing under the same tax ID and billing NPI. Uh, so no, the, that actually does not mean did that. not show up. Right, and that actually does not mean that. So what that's saying is the same provider, remember same provider is not just about tax ID or NPI, it's about specialty as well. So when we look at that, if it's two different specialties, you have a cardiologist, and an oncologist doing the exact same code on the exact, day, uh, exact same data service for the exact same patient, that will not hit that MUE. That's not what we're talking about here. No, if it, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> the procedure to procedure, I apologize for that. So the procedure to procedure edits, it has to be the same provider specialty. So okay. if it's not on there, we will not actually match those at all, ever. Um, now, that doesn't mean other bundling rules, like, you know, hospital bundling rules or um, maybe the physician fee schedule bundling rules don't apply, because there's a variety of other bundling rules, but related to CCI, it doesn't apply. Okay. So, she does go on to say, does Medicare classify psychiatrists and clinical social workers as different specialties? Yes, psychiatrists and clinical social workers are different specialties. Now, they can build incident to each other sometimes, and there's a variety of other factors, so I don't want to make it seem like it's always the same thing. It's always two separately billable services. It really depends on the billing situation. But yeah, technically, they are two different specialties. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry for any confusion I, I caused. It was kind of a long question. Um, next question says, uh, what if an existing drug gets a new indication that has a dose exceeding the existing MUE and NCCI hasn't been updated. Will claims deny? Will we have to appeal or submit a redetermination on each one? If yes, and you talked about this, what documentation is needed? And is there anything else that we can do to prevent the claim from denying initially? Or will that always happen until NCCI updates the MUE limit? 
there is nothing you can do to prevent it initially except right to these to this. Now keep in mind, I know that commonly the MUE isn't updated or isn't updated or that is only updated quarterly. Try that again. Commonly it's only updated quarterly. However, there are times when CMS um, does issue instructions or things to just do a, a manual update in between. We can do that too. But it only it's only at CMS's instruction. These are not answer guys. So start first writing here. Second, submit your claim. If you um, you know get a denial, then yes, you do have to follow the appeals process. That is what is set up by CMS in this case. And you will just want to document, hey, it's a new indicator, it's got a new admission, um, it's newly approved, however you want to say that. But yeah, that's what you'll do. Okay, and another question we got from Robin, it says, if you're using the RT and the LT on a bundled code, do you also need to use one of the X modifiers or the 59 modifier? Okay, um, so no, uh, RT, LT will override the edits, and, and the only reason I have been in note as I looked it up earlier today, let me go back up here for one second, I'm gonna go back to these FAQs, uh, and then I'm gonna come down, so if you put in an RT and an LT, they are right here. These are anatomical modifiers that will override. 59 is considered an other modifier, which will override. We always want you to use an anatomical before you would use an other. So no, you don't need, you don't need the two together. Um, I'm not even sure what would happen if you put the two together. I, I can't answer that question. I would have to go back and do a little bit of research, but it's not needed. All right, questions? Anything else? Uh, and that's the only questions that we have right this moment. Okay, perfect. So just want to move on a little bit here. Um, we did go through some locations and I've already gone through all this information. I put this in here just as helpful things, um, more informational for you, so that you had a reference source. It wasn't really the easiest way for me to get through some of this stuff. So uh, you can find the Excel spreadsheets on the CMS website. That's where you will need to go. Those are the most current. We do not have access to update them. They are given to us as a file. Um, so how do you get above those procedure codes if you don't like it? You have to use a modifier. If that doesn't work, guess what? You're gonna do an appeal. So helpful education materials are also there. And I do recommend taking a look at these edits. Again, this is that website, Brock Link, without having to navigate like I did. I did throw in just some other things that I find helpful when I look at different things, and there's a variety of different pieces of information here. I do think if you want to take a look at them, they may be helpful. They may not, but we'll see how it goes from there. So just a lot of different pieces that may help you out. Uh, I'm back to some questions, and I do want to go to some pre-submitted questions. If we have time, we'll see if we have any more open, but otherwise it'll just be the pre-submitted questions at this time. So what happens if a claim for an existing drug gets a new indication? We already talked about that. Yes, it will deny. Understand it's got a new indication. Make sure that you are, one, contacting that um, information, or I'm sorry, that email that I showed you, letting them know, but then also as the claims, if they are denied, we'll have to go through the appeal. Um, why, are, why are you performing a new patient, it is, it is. why are you, <laughs> when you perform a new patient exam and perform a minor procedure on the same day, when is it appropriate to build a modifier 25? This one's very hard for me to answer without the two procedure code combinations. Remember, we did look it up. So what you'll have to do is look up and see if they bundle together. And always, 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 if the minor procedure is in the primary, column A, then you would append a modifier 25 onto the ENM. If the ENM is in column A, then you would want to append a different modifier onto that minor procedure. So make sure you're using it. Best place to locate information, CMS website. Again, getting the most current one you got there. Um, how to apply modifier correctly for GI coding. Denials are all the time high. This is more specifically to MA plans. So I'm gonna tell you, I can't talk about MA plans. We don't know about MA plans. What I do know is yes, it's Medicare Advantage, but we are not um, with an MA plan. We don't have access to their information. Each plan is unique and individual. So you'll have to ask that plan. Um, so when there are two procedure codes and they don't have an NCCI bundle, but one CPT code has a separate procedure designation, is a modifier 59 required even though they do not bundle? Keep in mind, no, a modifier 59 would not be required, not for NCCI purposes. 
So if we're looking at it from a bundling purpose, we have to also then look at a couple of other places and make sure that it doesn't bundle in for those reasons. So I wanna make it as clear as possible. Why are some of the NCCI edits um, not always realistic when occurring in a clinical setting? Don't have any information on this. This is one of those general questions that must go to the people that write it. So just that's just how it's set up. Um, I, so ask that question to CMS's um, email there. The lookup tool, someone would really like a lookup tool where they don't have to go through and do what I did. Unfortunately, there is no easy lookup tool. What we have available to us are the lists that I showed you. Uh, where can you see all edits that are currently into effect and on there broken down by provider type or type of service? This does not exist. Again, an edit is not by provider type or type of service. Instead, it's by procedure code, so you want to make sure you're looking those up in that manner. Um, does the code you build need to be primary when looking it up. You want to make sure you look it up both ways in procedure to procedure edit. So the primary column A code and the primary column B code, make sure you look it up both so that you get to find out if it's primary or not. Because you have to know which one to put an override on, in other words, a modifier on. Please look it up both ways. For an office visit with an injection um, admin or with an EKG, can we build a G224, uh, G2211? This is an add-on code. And the add-on code is not about the other things that happen. Instead, it's about one, sitting down and looking at the total procedure, the total encounter today. What goes into that EMM code, that office visit code, versus what goes into the injection and what goes into the EKG code. So you then have to break it out, figure out, okay, I'm going to have this go into my injection and admin. This is going to go into the EKG. These are the components that are left and does it meet that highest level and then can it be appended in that manner? So it's not about yes or no, it's about really does it all work together. Um, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense there. One other question that I know we get all the time, why do I have to do an appeal? Why does Medicare decide this? We did not decide this. The appeal was decided by CMS. It's the way in which when they did their data analysis, it comes out the best possible way to do the medical review. What that means is they want to have these medically reviewed so they either have to do a pre or post pay medical review. Pre pay we mean every single claim you send in, it would meet that MUE, would stop and have to go through a medical review. On the other hand, they said, what if that's not the situation? What if it is truly a coding error? What if there are truly other things affecting? So what we would like to do then is do it through the appeals process and have a medical review, a manual medical review done in that manner. Not something we can talk about in terms of data analysis or why they came up with what they did, but that's why it's done that way. So hopefully that does make a little bit of sense. All right, that brings us to the end of the time. I just want to finish up with some slides here and then I'll let you go. That brings us to the end. I want to thank everyone for listening. Uh, I really encourage you to provide that feedback on the survey. Again, let me know the good, the bad, the ugly. What can we do to help you in the future? Remember, um, we also want you to include any other topics that do not have to be related to NCCI. We just want to get your topics in general. We would recommend that you review our live events page and we do hope to see you in future education. And we would also encourage you to listen to those encores. They may help you out. So on behalf of myself, Aline, all of Provider Arts and Education, thank you for participating. We look forward to your survey comments and we hope that you join us in the future. You may now disconnect.